stay hungry, stay foolish. Today is a good day. We are in our new studio here in the iconic offices in Dublin. And I am delighted to bring you a brand new series this time called Brains, Beliefs and Biases. And we're going to kick off with a book by Bobby Duffy called The Perils of Perception. Before we do, I want to thank our sponsor, Zai, who's enabled us to upgrade the show, the equipment, the camera that I'm recording on, a little too HD for my own liking, the microphone, the sound, hopefully everything's getting a bit better. And I want to thank them. They are boldly transforming the future of financial services with a suite of embedded products and services, empowering businesses to move funds with ease and enable multiple payment workflows. You can check out Zai at hellozai.com. For now, let's get into part one of Brains, Beliefs and Biases with Bobby Duffy on Perils of Perception. One in 10 French people still believe the earth may be flat. One quarter of Australians think that cavemen and dinosaurs existed at the same time. One in nine Brits think the 9-11 attacks were a US government conspiracy. 15% of Americans believe that the media or government adds secret mind-controlling signals to television transmissions. Our main interest in today's book is not niche stupidity or minority belief in conspiracies, but much more general and widespread misperceptions about individual, social, and political realities. Today's book, informed by 10 exclusive major polling studies by Ipsos across 40 countries, asks why in the age of the internet, where information should be more accessible than ever before, we remain so poorly informed. It is a pleasure to welcome the author of that book, The Perils of Perception, Why We're Wrong About Nearly Everything. Bobby Duffy, welcome to the show. Thanks, Adrian. Great to be here. It's great to have you on the show, Bobby. I've been a long time waiting to share this brilliant book that's here behind me. And I highly recommend it to our audience. I was telling you before I came on air, it's so essential reading for anybody who's making decisions, whether that's for a big organization, a transformation agent, or in your own life itself. It's so fascinating. And we'll get into it in a second. But I'd love to hear about the origins of the book, because you share in the book that throughout your life, you've had a lingering sensitivity to psychological tricks and you've spent the last 20 years at opinion research firm Ipsos Mori, designing and dissecting research from around the world to help understand what people think and do and why. For over a decade, you've run hundreds of surveys on public misperceptions, and this is what you call the perils of perception. I'd love you to share the origin story of how this all came about. Well, I guess for these studies in particular, it it started with work we were doing in the UK for um, number 10 on um, how people felt about crime uh, and crime rates. So it's because it was a lot of, there was a lot of focus on reducing crime at that time. This was sort of early in Tony Blair government in the UK, a lot of focus on reducing crime, a lot of focus, a lot more investment going into the police, all of those types of things. But when you ask people in surveys, um, whether crime was going up or down and how safe they felt. Everything, the public perception was everything was getting worse on crime, even though all the stats were showing it was getting better and all the investment was was going in. And so that sort of, uh, that kind of piqued my interest in perceptions of realities, measurable realities, things that not like opinions and not um, <clears throat> uh, things that are in doubt, but things you can actually measure pretty well. And what do the public think of those uh, realities do they do they get them right or wrong and the reason being not like a test it's not about intelligence or <clears throat> to prove people are right or wrong on particular things but to try to understand when they're wrong what does that signify um uh because that's i guess that's the kernel of the book is that these perceptions of realities are really rich uh when pe- particularly when people are wrong because there's all sorts of reasons that we get them wrong. And that's that's where the social psychology comes into it. Is this, this is not an IQ test. Um, this is about how we see the world and how we see the world is, is basically a function of two big buckets of things, what we're told and how we think. Um, 
Uh, and that's what, I, that's what I really enjoyed unpicking is the interaction between those two things, um, the information that we see and things that we experience, but then how we process that and then <clears throat> what that tells us about ourselves. It's absolutely fascinating. And, and, you know, it's something that's always been on my mind is about with ha being a parent is to be very careful what I say to my children, because you absolutely color their perceptions of the world, even comments about the neighbor, the pesky neighbor and everything. And then maybe they become more uh, against neighbors, etc. All those type of things are in my mind, but you really add the science and the surveys behind it. But I thought, Bobby, we'd start with a big question you ask at the start of the book. And I'll, I'll ask that question perhaps to our audience and then let you unpack how it unfolded for you, because this one is remarkable. I, I tested this out during the week with people. And I'd like our audience to think about this themselves for a moment before you unpack it and answer it, which is, is the Great Wall of China visible from outer space? And think about that for a second as an audience member, people watching us or listening to us, and think about what you truly think about that. And then Bobby will unpack what he has found through surveys and through his research. It's such a simple question, but it illustrates in different ways the kind of some of the main themes of the book. So the uh, reality is that it's not visible from outer space, from all the best research that I can find on it. After quite a lot of digging, I had to do a lot of <laughs> looking around on this. Um, but when you ask in surveys, and, and probably among your audience, <clears throat> certainly whenever I present this um, at different conferences, about 50%, I believe it is. And that's that's pretty consistent, actually. I've done it in very different audiences, and the surveys have been run in, very, in a wide range of different countries. And it's always about half of people think it is. Uh, which is really interesting, where you've got a reality that is pretty well known and measured, um, but half of uh, publics and populations think uh, they've got the wrong answer. Uh, and when you think about it, when you sort of pause, you do think, actually, it's a bit weird that you would think it's visible from outer space, because it, at, at its widest, it's only nine metres wide, um, which is about the same size as a regular house. Um, so... Uh, it is incredibly large, um, but it's its length that gives it that property. It is one of the largest, still one of the largest man-made structures on on Earth, but it's its length that gives it, and that's not going to make it visible um, from outer space, um, something being very long. So this, I, I break this down a bit into, there's four or five different things that this shows. First of all, shows what Daniel Kahneman would talk about as fast thinking, um, <clears throat> where... He, he splits into system one and system two thinking, Daniel Kahneman being, you know, uh, godfather of social psychology uh, and um, the behavioral science kind of knowledge that we've got today. And that fast thinking, system one thinking is you probably didn't think about this question very much. You just sort of reacted to it. You're not really searching and, and considering uh, length versus width and, and scale in order to, to work it out. We do also mix scales. That's the second one where we, we do think of length <clears throat> as being important. That's the uh, sheer size of this, the number of bricks that are in um, the Great Wall of China being one of the things that we we think of. But we also have a third one is that we, we also have this illusory truth bias, it's called, which is where you hear something. Um, the more you hear something, the more you're likely to believe it's true even if there's no real evidence for that. So the second time and third time you hear a lie or a mistruth, the more likely you are to, to believe it. And that's shown in lots of different experiments. And that's certainly the case with the Great Wall of China, because that has it was even an incorrect answer on a trivial pursuit question um, that it was visible from outer space. But then there's a couple of other points, and <clears throat> maybe the most important from the book's point of view, we sort of want it to be true. Um, uh, we kind of, it's a really interesting fact that, that, that we could build and particularly, you know, that many centuries ago, uh, people could build something that's visible from outer space is really interesting. And it's more emotional than we think it is. It's kind of, we're attached to that interesting, uh, fact, uh, and we sort of want it to be true. So th th that's one of the key themes of the book is that our emotions, <clears throat> and identities on other issues are tied up in our views of reality. Um, and that's really important. But there is a fifth and final point that I think is really important on this, which is that 
um, people do change their minds if, in the audiences when I uh, ask this question and then answer it with people. People kind of usually believe me um, when I tell them that it's uh, not uh, true. There's a lot of Googling sometimes in um, in the audiences just to double check, but people change their minds. And this is, again, a really important theme within the book is that while our view of reality is tied up with our identity and emotions and all sorts of things. It doesn't mean that people are completely set on that vision of reality and you can change people's minds because that's one of the, one of the things that uh, sometimes can, people can really worry about is we've got these misperceptions of reality and we're kind of stuck with them and there's no convincing people that they're, that this, uh, that there's a, a different and more correct um, <clears throat> view of those realities. So, yeah, so it's a it's a very simple question, but it kind of covers and illustrates um, a whole range of different effects that are going on that we see in other measures. Maybe more, well, definitely more important measures, not these sort of trivial pursuit type questions. It's so interesting for people in change roles, so transformation roles, which we cover a lot in the show, where mm. you don't change the business model until you change the mental model. Mm. You don't change what people Absolutely. do until you change how they think. And that part you mentioned there is very encouraging because the book I find is really encouraging that you can change people's perceptions. But one of the things I thought we'd put right up front and you've inspired me to do this now is you mentioned Daniel Kahneman and there's a really interesting interview that you quote in the book where you say, Daniel Kahneman, who's been studying this for 45 years goes, I've been doing this for 45 years and I haven't got any better. <laughs> yeah. and, and that seems quite pessimistic in a way. But then the interview expands and you, yeah. you say, because you because he understands system one and system two, and if we all do, and this is one of the inspirations behind this show, this particular episode, but in general in the show, the more information you have, we'll get into Dunning-Kruger later, that's a whole different <laughs> thing, but the more information you have, the more you can spot yourself in the midst of the bias. And I think that's really important is to train that muscle to go, Ah, Aiden, you know, mm. you're kind of biased about this because of your upbringing, your background, your parenting, mm. whatever it might have been. But you need to be aware of that when you go to make the decision. I'd love you to unpack that because that understanding that system one, the fast system is emotional. We can't really control that. That's in breath. That's in baked in. Mm -hmm. But system two, we have some control over. At least we have some awareness over. Yeah, no, <clears throat> no you said it really well, I think there. I think that's the System one is very useful because you can't think about all these things all the time. And so what, what Kahneman went on to say in this is, yes, I can't change that at all, but I can, uh, with effort, um, make system two kick in more. That is what we should be aiming in the right situations. You don't want it to be kicking in all the time because it would be exhausting and you, you couldn't live like that. But it is about spotting those times and trying to make, because it's not just about emotion, it is about the biases and heuristics that, that we have to the, the shortcuts, the mental shortcuts that we have to take through life um, in order to live it. Um, uh, but it. But you can equally have similar sorts of heuristics um, to help you not fall into your biases. Uh, and, uh, you know, we will probably cover this in more of the uh, discussion, but in the book, I, you know, it is just worth being aware of. We do have these tendencies to think things are going downhill when they're not necessarily going down, that everything is getting worse, and we've got to be mindful of that. Particularly if you're if you're working in transformation, <clears throat> uh, we tend to focus on negative information, um, and just n knowing these types of um, that they exist in our in our mindset as humans um, uh, is is really useful because it does give you pause to think: Am I thinking? Am I uh, looking at the evidence here or am I just falling into those sorts of traps? And there's, there's like half a dozen of those mental little ticks that you can take to say, uh, am, I, am I being misled by myself here on what, what I'm seeing? Well, let's build on that then. Seeing as you mentioned it, one of the things I thought was interesting was uh, when you think about people in transformation roles, particularly in legacy organizations, large organizations where they'll hark back to the good old days. And you talk about this rosy retros retrospection that we all are are capable of or, or susceptible to. Mm. And I thought it was really interesting when you talked about these trust surveys that are run, et cetera, and the crisis of trust. And it's as if 
things were better in the old days and you unpack this to show us that wasn't quite the case this is interesting and i'm jumping right to the end here mm -hmm. just to build on to the point that you made yeah no where's your retrospection is very uh powerful um and it's uh it was uh, there's a there's a very interesting set of experiments by uh um, an academic called terence mitchell who uh it tried to explore this in um in a quite uh prosaic way where he, he had him and his team interviewed people before they went on their holidays for their vacation um during it and then after it and um uh, and everyone went in the same sort of cycle of uh, excited anticipation before you go then um the you get there and on your holiday and it never quite goes completely to plan the reality of minor niggles kind of uh, set in and you return with a sense of mild disappointment um, when you come back not just about being back but about um uh, the experience itself and but that wasn't the point of his experiment they, they kept interviewing people for a long time afterwards and what they found is that the memory grows fonder the further away we get from it you kind of forget the bad bits the the kids being sick in the car or um uh lost luggage all of those types of things and, and you remember uh the walks on the beach and um the sunsets and whatever else and so we do have this tendency to edit out the bad from the past and that's quite a useful thing in sense of it helps us let go of bad things from the past you don't want to dwell on them necessarily but it has this negative side effect of making us think the past was better than it was so if you think the present and the future are worse than they are um because you've you've got this rosy view of the past and everything's going downhill and we see that in all sorts of ways in um uh in the in the research so when you ask people about the murder rate in countries uh you know four and ten or uh, up to half depending on the country um <clears throat> think that the murder rate is going up and in most countries it's going down and across all the countries that we looked at it's down nearly 30 percent um it's not a small percentage drop it's quite a big drop over the past uh 20 years uh, but that's not the perception four and ten think it's gone up more about the same think it's about the same uh, and only about 15 percent of people think it's gone down correctly so we've got this sense of decline which is is like is one of the most important things to bear in mind because it is uh a, a general trend that cuts across these types of things and lots of other things and it's the sort of um work that uh Steven Pinker and Hans Rosling focused on a lot is that this sense of this sense of worldwide decline is um is problematic um not because you want everyone to think that everything is great but the risk and this is the, the one that i focus on more in in my book the risk is if people think everything is in decline they get, they have less faith in the system and they're more likely to listen to people who say we need to tear it up and start again um and that's a that's where you get into sympathy for more authoritarian or populist kind of movements and in, in politics and that's that's a worry but in a kind of um even in our day-to-day -day lives and in our business lives, that sense of decline is really important because you, you've got really important to fight against because again, it can mislead us into thinking we need to tear it up and start again when actually there could, there could be more value in it than we're thinking. And that's really interesting. And hopefully we'll have a bit of time to talk about that, the political implications of this when there's fear, people yeah. are less more likely to go system one. They're more likely to, as you yeah. say, go to more drastic measures and you're more likely to have holocausts in those yeah. type of mindsets as well but uh you mentioned Stephen Pinker there there's a couple of things you mentioned first Stephen Pinker magnificent writer and thinker he wrote a magnificent endorsement for your book he said mandatory reading the mind this mind-altering book shows how most of us are badly deluded about the state of the world I thought that was just to say that that that's how much he respects this piece of work so congrats to you but the other thing is some people will be thinking as you said that about the delusional uh, view of the world that oh well that's educational that, or that's different countries mm -hmm. it does we'll get into that as well so don't uh, worry Bobby covers all of that as well and in a big way but I thought it was interesting to I'll jump back to 
the narrative of the book and the flow of the book, one of the interesting ones, and we've talked about this because we cover trends a lot on the show, we've covered population trends, etc. But one of the ones we talked about as well is this, the, the gray or the silver euro or pound or dollar mm. that, and the changes in perceptions there. And another question you ask, and I'll ask our audience to think about this, is how many of your population, whatever mm. country you're in, do you think are 65 and older? Think about that for a second. And again, Bobby, I'd love you to unpack that. Mm. Over to you. Yeah, really interesting one as well. It's kind of, um, uh, it, it varies a lot across the world. The reality varies a lot across the world. You've got a big range of aging societies and younger societies, obviously in more developing um, countries. But the pattern on estimations is the same, is that we go way too high in terms of, uh, the age of our, uh, the average age or the, uh, what proportion of our population are, are older. So this is, this is one of the examples where we've kind of heard about um, the aging population and we have this um, overblown sense or it, we, we, we think it's something to worry about. We know that. We know that we've got a concern about aging populations and it's going to be more difficult in the future and it's a challenge on our health services and having enough working age people to support older people and all of those types of things. So this is a classic example of one of the key themes of the book, which is emotional enumeracy, um, which is a, another of the key concepts in this. And that basically says that when you're estimating something uh, and you overestimate it, for example, that cause and effect are working in both directions. So we don't just um, worry, uh, overestimate what we worry about. It, we, uh, we worry about what we overestimate as well. So it goes in both directions. Um, it's not, uh, when, we got, when we think something is a concern or it's bad, it inflates in our minds. It takes up uh, more of our, our thinking. So we think it's bigger than it really is. And we, just, we see the same sort of thing with um, uh, crime rates. We see the same sort of thing with immigration levels in some countries where there is concern about immigration. And we see the same with it on this with aging population. We know it's a worry. Uh, we know it's a concern or a challenge for um, society. So we inflate it and we think we've got many more older people in our countries than we actually have. One of the ideas that is interesting is I, I often, when I was reading your book, I thought of the movie, The Truman Show and how they, it, it's scripted reality really, but Truman doesn't know that this is the case, which is played by Jim Carrey and that how the information that we see can absolutely flavor our perception of the world and become our reality because perception is reality for many people. And you say in the book that post-truth is the idea that objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. And in 2016, the word post-truth was named word of the year by Oxford Dictionaries. You tell us further that technological shifts are particularly terrifying in their effect on our accurate view of the world or key issues, because the quantum leap in our ability to choose and others to push individual realities at us plays to some of our deepest biases in preferring our existing worldview and in avoiding conflicting information. Really important factor for disruption and innovation, this one. But that's exactly the point you were making here. If we only focus on what's out there, what we're told, will miss a key element of the problem, which is, as you say, it's partly how we think, not just what we think, what information we receive that causes so much of the misperceptions that we have of the world. Mm -hmm. I thought this was such a key point because you mentioned the uh, enumeracy that we have, the difficulty mm -hmm. with numbers, but when it comes to exponential numbers mm -hmm. and changes in technology and a world that's unfolding before our eyes at a really rapid pace, we can really struggle. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's um, uh, understanding it from both of those directions of what we're told and how we think um, and how what we're told is changing is really important. And I think, I mean, at, at the heart of that challenge with how different groups and tribal identities see realities is confirmation bias or um uh, and disconfirmation bias is a group of effects that um, are probably 
best thought of as directionally motivated reasoning or, or just motivated reasoning, where you've got we, one of our deepest biases is to look for and believe information that fits with our already held views and to avoid or denigrate information that goes against those views. It's kind of, it's quite psychologically painful for us to change our minds about things or, or to think that we were wrong. So we tried not to do it um, as much as we can. You kind of, you need to reach this tipping point where the evidence and information outweighs the cost of um, changing your view. So if you, you know, it, it, it creates this cognitive dissonance in us where um, our own views are not fitting with the reality and it reaches a tipping point where it's actually less painful to change your view than hold on to a view that um, is clearly wrong um, to us. So this, this is very powerful, but it's also, it's like right at the heart of our information system, the technological information system. And in a very, very important way, this is not, this is not um, just about people creating their own echo chambers or filter bubbles of of who they are looking at in the little groups they're in. It's also the unseen algorithms that push uh, information towards us that that the platforms and others think we'll like. Um, and they do that because these are massive advertising systems that are basically selling um, your presence on uh, on their pages. Um, and they they know, and we know, but you know, in their own experiments, the platform that the platforms have done when they've tried to mix up the information that they show people to come from different perspectives, they know that people click away faster, that you stay on longer if you're seeing stuff you already agree with um, or fits your worldview. So it's kind of built in to the system where, you know, where the internet is, is built on surveillance and confirmation bias is a type of currency that it's got, whereas, you know, that's what it kind of trades in is giving us what, we already want to see. So yeah, the, it, the really important to see this is systemic, that it's not, um, it's not just one side or that it's not just evil platforms or evil groups pushing out particular uh, views. And it's not just us being, um, uh, you know, very tribal or, or uh, wanting to just see what we like It's the interaction between those two things at scale a scale that we've not been able to do previously that's the shift and that's that's the that's one of the the key worries uh for our views of reality and our uh, you know uh, our discourse more uh, public discourse more generally and bobby shares very generously at the end of the book 10 principles where we can actually take action about this and actually work on system two at least at least practice that muscle and work that muscle a bit including the filter bubbles and we'll talk about filter bubbles in a moment again bobby i'm reacting to things you say and jumping around the book so to <laughs> clarify things for our audience as well one of the things you mentioned there is an extremely important term and we had the great pleasure of having an episode with elian aronson who is now 90 91 amazing excellent. man excellent. who worked as you know with leon festinger mm. trained under leon festinger and Festinger, of course, is the man who brought us the concept of cognitive dissonance. This is mm. extremely important. You mentioned about the pain of changing our mind. Literally, it's painful for the brain, mm. but also it is possible. But mm -hmm. many, many leaders and organizations know, for example, there's a melting iceberg. They know the platform is burning, but mm. cognitive dissonance helps them <laughs> ignore it, even though it's happening in the background. Mm. All of that great work. Um, uh, you know that, that goes back decades now and has been um you know shown in in many many different contexts shows just how tightly we can hold on to we want to hold on to that um existing uh world view and uh, uh, it's um it is a uh well in the book it runs throughout the book in lots of um different ways and the uh the kind of tips and tricks that um, you show are actually, it's kind of the modern environment has given us uh, some exemplars of how people can get, get around that, can um, uh, uh, avoid falling into the worst of that trap. And there was a really interesting experiment on 
uh, by in, in the US on testing um, professors and PhD students against fact checkers on um, how they actually uh, sort um, reality from uh, uh, fake news online. They were given these tasks to do. And one of the things that I think is a really useful principle more, more generally is what, if in the end, the fact checkers were much better than the uh, Ivy League professors and um, PhD uh, students uh, at, at sorting fact from fiction on this. And the reason was that the PhD and professors, PhDs and professors went really deep. They went deep into um, uh, an individual source, uh, looking down instead of across. And what fact checkers tended to do was just have, you know, very in a very sort of pra pragmatic, practical way, they had dozens of tabs open. They looked across. They looked for verification by going to other sources and um, uh, opening, you know, following trails that go uh, wide rather than deep. And that's a, a really interesting skill set and um, uh, approach in, in our modern environment where you, you do tend to get pulled down into rabbit holes where you're going deeper and deeper into things which are just, you know, reconfirming <laughs> what you've already thought rather than going against it. Whereas um, what the fact checkers do is look widely across. And, and if you're thinking of that in a cognitive dissonance frame, what they're doing there is really, you know, because they're coming to it with their own biases, they're not automatons themselves. What they're doing there is you're building an evidence base that cuts across to help you change your mind. You may have a view on something um, that is uh, that you come to it with or you have you've established early on in the process that you think this is the reality but they verify check and verify across rather than plowing on with that that one uh, particular thought and that's very i think that's very relevant to that cognitive dissonance point is you're, you're looking to reach that tipping point of changing of changing your mind and you can do that much better by cutting across than going deep um, is is the lesson that i take from that yeah, and I, I have a, a mental model for it, Bobby, that I call cro crossing swim lanes. So you need ah. to swim across the swim lanes rather than actually, or in the whole pool, or explore outside other pools, exactly yeah. to your point. And, and as you know well, it's one of the big challenges we have with the big challenges for the planet is that there's so many experts, but they're not collaborating or diversifying mm. their neurodiversity. Mm -hmm. yeah, key. And it's also a point for neurodiversity in organizations. The more diverse the mindsets, the better the solutions from people as well. So it's a key point. There, there, was, a, there was a really interesting part of the Festinger work that you, you mentioned in the book, which is, yes, it's possible to change minds. Yes, it's possible to change what people think. But sometimes people will cling to <laughs> realities even when they've been proven wrong. And this is the work of the Festinger, and you mentioned that the apocalyptic yeah. cult. This is fascinating. Yeah, no, this is, it's like a, it's been seen in lots of different environments since then, but it's, um, it's that even when your apocalyptic prediction, if you've got a cult that thinks the world is going to end on a particular day and it doesn't end on that day, um, the steps that people will go through in order to still hold on to that cult belief is incredible in terms of rewriting what the prediction was to be. It was just slightly out, so it's going to be in. I think it's been in an. Yeah, it's in The Simpsons, isn't it? The Simpsons always in The Simpsons. Uh, Homer has done the same, exactly the same sort of thing. He got the calculation slightly wrong, so you, you'll go back. And then they, there's all these uh, tri uh, tricks and mental gymnastics that you can do to hold on to the belief and. And again, I mean, like the cults are a niche concern, um, but the um, same, the reason it's important is it kind of points to how some of us think, uh, well, how a lot of us get pulled into thinking about our political identities or our connection to particular political parties, because it's quite, it's quite clear that in some circumstances, your political identities become so strong that almost anything is acceptable from the side that you support. And this is you know, one of my big concerns in, in my day job at, at King's, King's College London and as being in a policy institute. 
uh, now is the extent to which these tribal identities outweigh good decision making um, in politics or in any other sphere of life. And, and so that's, that's where all that Festinger work and lots of other great work on cults is not just about understanding the cult, it is about how those tendencies to um, uh, really hold on to those strong, once those, once those identities get really strong among people, um, really hold on to them despite all the evidence against and despite uh, the, those, those identities leading to actions we wouldn't normally accept. That, that is the real problem here. And I kind of, um, that's where we get into culture wars and the tribal identities that culture wars tends to uh, invoke in, in some countries. And I'm, yeah, they, they're the kind of things that I'm, that you worry about in, um, uh, in, in its impact on wider society. Not that we'll all join cults, but that some of those behaviors leak into more mainstream political uh, impact. And and if you look at any of the history of any type of um, genocide or any type mm. of tragedy, it always started with a small group of people who had this reality and then built on it and built yeah. on it and fed other people. And then in times of fear, we're mm. able to manipulate and uh, influence others. And I, I find it really fascinating that you wrote the book before the pandemic. Mm. It must have been fascinating for you to see the pandemic unfold and in line with things like and by the way i'm thinking here i was trying i was going to avoid saying these two words because i know when i put this episode out on youtube it will be downplayed in the filter bubble because <laughs> i'm going to say trump and brexit which you do focus on in the book yeah that, that's a, that's us going to limit our views by the way on, <laughs> on youtube because you get actually limited if you mention things like that are, are political. So, okay. um, but there's a key before we get into that. And before we get into inoculation, because you do go right back to the polio inoculation and vaccines. And I think that's really important for people to know that what we saw unfold during the pandemic and the conspiracy theories, etc., right. is not uncommon. This is, this is actually common. This has happened before in the past. There's been rejections, etc. We'll get mm. into that in a sec, but mm. there's a key paragraph that I'd love to quote, and maybe you'll riff on this one, Bobby, it, you said, these days, information technology and social media present even more challenges to our perception of facts. Given the extent to which we can filter and tailor what we see online and how it inc is increasingly done without us even noticing or knowing it, filter bubbles and echo chambers incubate our misperceptions, beautifully said, unseen algorithms and our own selection biases help create our own individual realities. The pace of technological progress that is allowing this splintering is frightening, but also so apparently complex and unstoppable that it's numbing. A very few years ago, the suggestion that we would be, each of us be experiencing our own individual realities online would seem like something out of Black Mirror, but now it's accepted with a shrug. That is dangerous because it plays to some of our deepest psychological quirks, our desire to have our already held views validated, and our instinctive avoidance of anything that challenges them. Now, I know you've built on that a little bit, but maybe you'll want to riff on that a beautifully, beautifully written paragraph. Oh, thank you. Yeah. No, I think, I mean, look, this, this is constantly moving. And the challenge is uh, the technology outpacing uh, our abilities to regulate or think about what we're actually designing it just sort of happens and there's you know there's been a an awful lot of people that have been involved in uh, uh creating those types of online worlds who've had a lot of mea culpa moments afterwards and <laughs> gosh i wish i hadn't quite uh done that um in terms of uh uh, putting in the capabilities without thinking how it interacts with our human biases. And I think that's one of the themes of how um, that, that online environment has, has grown as we, we actually thought, uh, well, I think we, I think it was lots and lots of people who did genuinely think that this is just going to make things better because you're opening up information and, and, and uh, opportunities for people to connect in ways that um, just weren't possible before. So there's lots and lots of upsides and those upsides are, are true, but we just didn't also 
think that we've got these human biases and we're going to pull it towards those biases of wanting to be in an in-group against an out-group, um, confirmation bias and those cognitive dissonance points that focus on negative and emotional information that, you know, we know that emotional information and conflict-based information travels further and faster in these media, social media environments. So it creates a sense of division that isn't doesn't reflect the reality. I mean, a lot of my work since the book has been on um, that sort of polarization of uh, societies, and uh, it, it it is built into these uh, platforms that uh, that more negative and more emotional and more conflict based language will travel further and faster. Um, uh, online, the more reason debate. So we we got we're sort of portraying this image of a very divided um, uh, world uh, that is at, at odds with each other. That doesn't really reflect the reality um, outside of that. When you actually see people in in real life, and uh, but the point about the technology is it just keeps changing. And now I was uh, the writing of the book. We were very worried about deep fakes and deep fakes being used in political settings, um, deep fakes being, you know, proper, um, where you can just have uh, anyone say it, type in um, uh, anything that you want someone to say and the video will look like they are saying it. And that is a worry in, you know, in all sorts of uh, environments. But now you've got, <laughs> looking forward, you have got the metaverse um, type proper, proper virtual uh, reality strands coming um and you know that that will be people creating their, their own realities and living in their own realities as it as it as it develops so yeah these these and the problems are really difficult to regulate against uh, or control those types of technologies because it's just moved so fast and um the regulation moves so slow uh, so we, we we need to come up with better ways of thinking about what do we want to achieve through this? Because there is this sense that there's nothing you can do and it's just happening um, and we have to accept it. And I, there's some encouraging signs, more encouraging signs that uh, people, governments and, and uh, organisations like the European Commission are starting to think more seriously about how do you, we can actually in, impose some sort of order on this and and try to improve the environment. So I think we'll, uh, more encouraging signs, but incredibly difficult to do, and diff incredibly difficult to control this, and lots of downsides in trying to control it. You don't really want state-sponsored truth either. You do you how you intervene in order to uh, avoid the worst of these sorts of environments, um, while not giving control over. The environments to state authorities or other regulators is a, is a really really tough line to tread and then you you think about you were talking about state truths there i mean the if you think about the bbc or any type of national broadcaster their role should be for content but when they have a commercial intent or in commercial responsibility they compete against these organizations who don't really care they want to just get first get the information out there and uh, that's no disrespect to those organizations but speed and if it bleeds it leads are so important in those realms but then they may miss the boat with the content it may be later maybe slower and i know there's some um some entities out there that have slower news on purpose but it's more fact checked etc but a lot of cases people don't care because they're consuming on social media they're just consuming the headline in many cases and as you say that feeds their realities they believe that's realities as well but we won't go into there we've covered that before yeah. and there's a lot of that's that's a show in itself that we we won't go into but i wanted to add something else that's also a difficulty so when i i played a 10 year career uh, as a rugby player bobby I played over in london and london irish mm -hmm. and uh, i was I wasn't the most talented player, but I was really disciplined and I looked for any kind of edge that I could get 
including diet so diet or training mm -hmm. and this was pre show this the betraying my age here pre youtube pre internet at the way we know it today so content was difficult to find information was difficult to find and i, I used to think oh if only i had the information then but today the amount of information is actually causing a totally different issue one is you find conflicting information for everything mm -hmm. And that means people don't know where to look. Like I've looked at this for everything from ADHD, for uh, mm. people with autism, for any type of, uh, for, for even the pandemic, for is the vaccine causing heart attacks? Is it not? All this type of mm. different things. And this is really difficult for people because it's not only the filter bubble, it's an mm. overload of information. Absolutely. TMI, too much information. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. And it is it is um <clears throat> it is a problem and it's um uh it's the it's related to that all the great work on the paradox of choice that where actually giving people lots of choice makes it really difficult for them to make a choice um because you can you can have too much and it's the same it's the same sort of thing with this information about how to, who to believe and it's kind of and the uh, we kind of we've made some mistakes in this as well as in society and media organizations because it was um big discussions at the bbc and other media outlets about balanced reporting where you would often see you know reports on um say vaccine safety or climate change and uh, hum uh, human made climate change and you would say you would um uh, what the understanding of balanced reporting was was you would have you know, eighty or ninety percent of the program or segment would be yes everyone agrees vaccines are safe or that humans have had a role in climate change but there's these couple of people who think um, that that's not the case vaccines are unsafe or um, climate isn't uh, climate change isn't human um, driven and the trouble with that is that people hear. I hear and hold on to that exception rather than the reality of this. And we've got actually, I've got a survey, a big study coming out across Europe. Um, it hasn't been released yet, but it showed we asked people in in that about um, their perceptions of what percentage of climate scientists do you think um, agree that climate change is human driven? And the reality, according to uh, lots of studies is something like 99.7 or 99.3 or whatever it is it's really incredibly high among um uh, climate scientists but the average guess is people think that about 70 percent of um climate scientists agree that it's, it's a human um that climate change is human driven so much much lower perception they think that that's the average guess so the people that think even lower and people who think a bit higher so you got this yeah that people think that 30 percent of climate scientists don't think it is and that that's because well, that's partly because how people do these sorts of estimates but it is also because they see these exceptions and they take up more space than the the reality is and you also kind of are drawn to exceptions when you think when you are presented with um information so that that is a real that's a real challenge not just the uh volume of information it's also how our brain works in processing that where we're a bit drawn to those exceptions and they're given more weight even though in they don't reflect their that weight in um reality so yeah it's, 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 a, it's a real problem we've talked about that we've talked about the challenges and we'll, we'll get into the solutions your 10 kind of uh, principles at the end of the show but um i'd love to delve a little bit deeper into some of the the surveys that and what they unveiled and I'm really interested in the next topic. We cover it a bit on the show because we're interested in healthy body also because it's good for a healthy mind and actually helps you make more decisions, helps you consume more content. If you're going to be working and it helps you attend better and you tell us on identifying misperceptions about health is really, really important for us. Doing so forces us to look at the realities of how we take care of ourselves. And in many cases, the actual health statistics are absolutely shocking and you uncover so many of these in the book and this is especially true when it comes to our weight and diet i'd love you to share this with our audience this stuff was absolutely shocking to me yeah no we have a a, a terrible uh misperception of our own 
uh, our, our national level um, healthiness. So we we just massively underestimate how many of us are overweight or obese. Um, and it, it, it was a shock to, to me. I mean, the realities are a shock, first of all. I mean, this is one of those when you collect all the data and you find, you know, two thirds of people are overweight or obese in the US and it's, it's not much better here uh, in the UK and uh, islands not but similar as well. So it's all these, the realities are incredibly high, but the estimates are really quite low as well. So you've got big gaps here where you've got people down at uh, uh, some of the countries, it's like uh, people estimating um, four in 10 or, or three in 10 uh, people. So half in some, and, you know, in some countries like Saudi Arabia, just incredible state of denial about the extent to which they have a, a, a weight problem as a, as a nation. Um, so yes, yeah, so now you've got these um, incredible gaps and the, the worry about that is it shows that we're not worried enough. If you see what I mean, because it's kind of, we know that when people are concerned about something, they tend to inflate it in their minds. And this shows that we're even with all the evidence and all the, discussion on these types of things we still don't quite get how bad it is um and that that is a bit that's a lot related to our sort of social set and how we compare ourselves with others and um uh, all those problems because we think it's we think um uh, uh the the people that we're not too overweight ourselves and the people around us look similar to us and that creates this sense that it's all okay when it's um actually uh not at all um so yeah no so it it's one of the ones and it's quite unusual in the in the scope of the book where we tend to be too worried about things um on some of these personal health ones we're not worried enough um and that's um that change that uh, affects how we react because if you're if you think it's okay you're less likely to take action um and that's uh yeah that is a worry on our health yeah, now I'd like to come back to uh, one of the key principles of all that, which is where you were saying about climate change. And we're doing this magnificent series we're in the midst of it with Jeffrey West of the Santa Fe Institute on mm. climate change and, and, and the planet, essentially. And I thought of him when I was reading your book, and I'm going to mention to him one of the things that you say is that it's almost because there's so much content out there that that actually has sometimes a detrimental effect about the alarming changes that we're experiencing, that we kind of go towards a new meme and we think, oh, well, somebody else is on it because we're, we, we've got it covered because it's so much in the press, et cetera. And yeah. that can actually have a, a backfire effect for many things. And I thought that was really interesting, both with the health issues, but also with the planet as well. Yeah, no, that's right. I mean, I do think there's, um, it's really, interesting about how what's the right level of worry and concern that you should have to change it to encourage change on an issue it's a really fascinating area that campaigners are struggling with all the time about what's the line of um uh, getting people worried and concerned enough but not think that it's hopeless and all done and so there's no point in doing anything about it and and it's this really interesting interaction between concern, but also a sense of efficacy that we can actually affect change. And this, again, it's an important thing for leaders in um, organizations, particularly ones that need transformation, is, is that extent of getting, and you, you, know, you recognize it in your own kind of uh, running of organizations, is getting the sense of uh, burning platform, <laughs> but without they say it's just going to burn down, and there's nothing you can you can do about it. And I, I am, uh, and that is very much the case in things like climate. Um, about how do you uh, how do you get people to take it seriously enough? Um, because it's um, more of a a future risk than a very current in day to day experience. But but we need to act now. But it's huge and relies on other people acting and uh, uh all of those things make it really difficult to get people at the right level of concern and there was lots of um 
there was lots of angst around a book by David Wallace Wells, which was um, uh, about uninhabitable Earth, which some climate campaigners were saying is worse than climate denial because what 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 he did was bring together all the worst case scenarios and say what would happen if all of these things happened. Um, and it made it, for some people, the argument was it made it sound hopeless. So, and that put people off um, uh, making change. And then other people would push back and say, uh, no, that's not the case. You need these sorts of books, an incredibly popular book that that um, uh, there's no doubt opened some people's eyes to, to uh, the problems involved. So it's kind of, it's a really complex area about correct level of concern to uh, promote change. Um, without either too much complacency or too much fatalism that nothing can be nothing can be done um i find that really fascinating and a really useful thing to think about in more day-to-day -day problems and there's a lovely red thread to later on in the book where you introduce a, a section called one versus many mm. and here you tell us about the work of paul slovic a mm. professor of psychology at the university of oregon who has studied what he termed beautiful term psychic numbing mm. for decades, which is where the scale of tragedies or need for help drive us to inaction, which is tied to what you said there. But I thought this was particularly fascinating with the Ukraine crisis at the moment, mm. because he states most of us are caring and will exert great effort to rescue the one whose plight comes from the, to their attention. But these same people often become numbly indifferent to the plight of the one who is one of many yeah. in a gr much greater problem. Why do we, good people ignore mass murder and genocide, you ask? Pe specifically, it is our inability, our inability to comprehend numbers again, that numeracy problem, and relate to that to mass human tragedy that stifles our ability to act. I thought that again was fascinating. And again, linking that to transformation efforts, you need to keep it in the right level of att of attainment. So can I can I do it? Is it possible? Or is the task just too big? Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. And there's one sort of example from Slovich and others work that I really liked, um, which was uh, when he when he, he runs these experiments about uh, how much would you donate <clears throat> to different causes with people and um, the one of them was about providing safe water um, in uh, uh, to a refugee camp, um, I think it was, and um, and it, he he played with the the scales that you would use. So one was um, both were saving a hundred thousand people. If you did, if you gave this donation, you would ensure that a hundred thousand people got this safe water. Um, but in one of the examples, it was um, uh, a camp that was 100,000 people and you would save everyone. And the other was 100,000, you would be able to get to 100,000 people out of 300,000 people that were at in this um, uh, camp. And uh, people were much more willing to give money to the 100,000 camp, so where everyone was given access to safe water, even though it was the same number of people in the 300,000 camp that would get um, uh, the safe water under his scenario. And that's just really interesting. And it shows that we like solutions. <laughs> we like to think, if I do this, then that's that thing solved and I can tick it off. Not that I'm helping towards this, uh, in, in this case, to the same scale, I'm helping towards a bigger problem at the same scale. Um, so that's really interesting when you think of the complexity of human emotions, and particularly if you're doing transformation work or you're working in businesses more generally, that sense of completion or um, I am uh, sorting this uh, properly is really important to us uh, rather than just I am making progress. And that's a, really useful to, to think about that when you're, when you're communicating and trying to inspire um, teams. There's so many elements, isn't there, that, that you have to keep. And it, I'm very wary as well with the show of giving too much information, but also giving 
almost like breadcrumbs towards the ability to make the change happen and that it's not it's not uh, unattainable mm. but um there's a really fascinating thing that is linked to this and i'm also always reminded of leo tolstoy's quote here he said everyone thinks of changing the world but no one thinks of changing himself or herself and this is linked to your section on herd behavior because you say we have to be so cognizant of the dangers of our herding instinct as a as a species. Mm. And the quote that I picked here is, it seems we may be in denial on our personal consumption of sugar. And we're definitely underestimating how fat we are, as we've discovered. But there remains the key question of whether better communicating the huge scale of our health challenges to people actually help shift behavior to what you were talking about. It mm. seems obvious that knowing the truth is an important first step to acting on it. But is it, you ask? And you mm. go on to say, our focus should instead be on individual behavior and overcoming personal barriers to healthier choices mm. rather than on a societal epidemic where it's all too easy to just go along doing the same things as everyone else. Again, as mm. you said, seeing people around you. And I thought, again, this is interesting to those change makers who listen to the show because we try to boil the ocean rather mm -hmm. than actually start with the willing, those people who are willing to make the mm -hmm. change, get some small wins and then build on those successes. I'd love you to give your view on that, Bobby. Yeah, I mean, it's very connected to that that point of hope and hopelessness that, that people can have in this. And it is, it is, uh, particularly, you know, around health type behaviors, we know that um, uh, it's not particularly helpful to just bang on about a um, obesity epidemic, and um, it doesn't it doesn't motivate people, doesn't it doesn't um, personalize it for them, and it can give the sense of hopelessness that you know this is this is beyond our control, as as well as um, a sense that this is the norm and like one of one of the, the, the linking to your point about the herding um we are incredibly social creatures uh where what our perception of the norm is is really important in our own behavior um and there was a, there's great experiments uh, on this in or research on this in princeton university in you know in 1960s or 70s where uh, they had a very strong drinking culture, and new new uh, vice chancellor comes in and is worried about this and uh, wants to ban keg parties where you got lots of beer um, and got lots of pushback from people about uh, doing that. So they did some research on it, and what they found was that there was a whole stack of people who actually didn't really like that drinking culture, but they thought it was the culture. So they were all um, protesting for something where quite a lot of them didn't actually want it to continue because they thought it was the norm. And this was what they, they thought that everyone else loved it when actually there was a big chunk of them, if they'd been more honest about um, uh, what they were thinking, actually didn't love it, but they wouldn't express that because they felt um, they'd be out of line with the norm. And and that that is that's one of the key, again, these lines that you've got to tread where you want to uh on like an obesity crisis where you want to uh, say we've got a real problem with this um and it's very widespread without turning it's very difficult then not to turn it into a norm as in if you're saying telling people this is a really widespread outcome for lots of people it also makes it feel like that is the social norm and we will follow the social norms rather than fight against them. So it's a really, it's a tricky one. And where, <clears throat> where in you'll see, you, you'll have seen increasingly in um, communications or health communications on that tend not to get those big messages of crisis or um, this is widespread um, uh, uh, from um, uh, health bodies, but much more tailored, much more specific um and much more what we can do type messages rather than just describing a widespread problem. And that, that's, that's um, 
That's not because there's a denial of the, it is an issue. It's just because actually it's not very effective and quite risky to just bang on about the scale of the problem. It reminds me of uh, an Emerson quote that to be yourself in a world that is constantly trying to make you something else is the greatest achievement. And mm. the reason I say that is the herding instinct. I I played rugby, and as you know, rugby has a certain uh, ethos. It's it's changed a lot in professional rugby. But I wasn't ever much of a drinker, and it was always a challenge for me. Like I used mm. to leave the game, go home, do my recovery sessions because I, as I say, I wasn't that talented. So I had to do those those little bit extra. So I usually wouldn't drink very much because I knew how detrimental it was to recovery. But I, incur I, I incurred a huge wrath for that going against the herd yeah. mentality. And even now, in my career, essentially as as a gig economy worker, mm. is unusual for people, and they can't get their head around it. Mm. And it's it can be challenging. Yeah. And you know, I, I I say all that to say think of our children because one of the great benefits of of trying to play sport at that age at a young age was it brought you into a different type of community that was somewhat interested in its health you know so you you had a game at the weekend therefore you didn't uh, mm. you never dabbled in drugs or anything like that because mm. it just wasn't in your consciousness and it makes me always think about my children again is that it's so important who they're surrounded by mm. their friends their teachers their communities are so important because that probably has a bigger influence than the parent alone mm -hmm. because they're constantly around those people yeah no absolutely i think that our environments are incredibly important and it's like um particularly on health and i kind of in our in our wider work um the uh the, the model of the social determinants of health is incredibly well explored now and really you know great work by you know, it's a whole series of people but michael marmot is probably most associated with it in from a uk perspective is just looking at the whole panoply of effects on people's health that is all to do with yeah a, a lot to do with uh family genetic you know it goes from genetics of family to and it goes in these concentric circles of different types of effects but where you know who you're around, who you see, uh, as well as the health services and systems that support you. It's a kind of this complex interplay from, you know, from different directions, uh, but where your environment has a, a huge effect on you. And um, not just it's not just about individual characteristics or willpower or genetics or all those types of things. It is, it is very much a socially determined outcome um health and um you, you've got to keep that in mind and one of the other things is as as we know education so when the parent shows more interest in the kids homework and education mm. more likely to perform better in school and then also i read one about reading that when the parent is has books around the house even just lying around the kids more likely to read yeah. so i i think that's it, it's important to know that if yeah. if you have the privilege of being a parent or even as an auntie or an uncle or something to be encouraging the children in that way. But I, I wanted to jump to something we mentioned earlier on and not to disappoint our audience because I found your book and this section almost prophetic because you wrote it, as I said, before the pandemic. And I'll intro, I'll intro this as you do in the book and the section you call it is inoculating against ignorance. So mm -hmm. here we go. It's 12th of April, 1955, 10 years to the day from the death of President Roosevelt, the world's most famous polio victim. We're at the University of Michigan waiting to hear the results of Dr. Jonas Salk's trial of the polio vaccine. 500 people are in the room, including 150 from the media, along with 16 television cameras, some relaying the results to 54,000 physicians in cinemas across the country. People are listening to the radio in the US and all around the world. The results are broadcast on department store loudspeakers and judges suspend trials so people can listen. Paul Ofit, the vaccine scientist, writes, the presentation was numbing, but the results were clear. The vaccine worked. Inside the auditorium, Americans tearfully and joyfully embraced. Church bells were ringing across the country's factories were observing, observing moments of silence. Synagogues and churches were holding prayer meetings and parents and teachers were weeping. It was as if a war had ended, one observer recalled. 
Salk received a gold medal from President Eisenhower, and in 1985, President Ronald, Ronald Reagan proclaimed that this country should celebrate Salk Day. Salk had ensured the impact of his discovery by not patenting the vaccine. When asked by an interviewer who owned, who owned the patent, he replied, well, the people, I would say, there is no patent. Could you patent the sun? Fast forward to present day, and the contrast between those scenes and how we and how those currently working on vaccines are viewed by a section of the public could not be starker. Mm. You wrote this before the vaccine. I found that mm. absolutely or before the pandemic. Mm. I found that absolutely fascinating. And mm. maybe you'll give us a bit of your viewpoint on the polio vaccine and then mm. the change. And bearing in mind, again, you were talking about the change before the recent pandemic, and mm. that has just exasperated it even further yeah no really really interesting area because it's um it was one of the one of the questions that i was most worried about i suppose one, one of the results that i was most worried about um even you know before the pandemic because what, what we found was that um we asked people whether uh, vaccines some vaccines cause autism in healthy children um, not whether they can, it just it was like a statement of fact. Some um, true or false, some vaccines cause autism in healthy children. And um and the, it was really worrying because it this was around 35, 37 countries um that we asked this, and, and only four in ten people said it was definitely false that that's the case. And then uh, one in five people said it was definitely true <laughs> that, that it does cause. Uh, some vaccines cause autism in, in healthy children. This was obviously based on the controversy around the MMR um, vaccines that you, you will have seen, which you come back to. And then there was a lot of people in the middle. You got the rest of them in the middle saying, I don't know um, whether it does or not. And that in itself is a worry, just not knowing um, that kind of sense uh, sense of um, sense of doubt. And I'm... Um, so that that's, that's the context. You've got uh, only one in five people definitely saying, uh, sorry, one, one in five people definitely saying that it's true and only four in 10 people definitely saying that it's false, that you've got this risk um, from vaccines. And that's, that's, that was a, a terrible context going into a pandemic where vaccines were going to be uh, absolutely crucial elements of our getting back to normal life and saving people's lives. And I think what it's shown really um, uh, is that uh, what the experience of the pandemic has shown is that actually we've done pretty well in coming out of um, the pandemic and in acceptance of um, vaccinations across lots of countries, not all because there's, there's been uh, problems in some countries, but we've actually done pretty well uh, from it. And it's... Um, uh, and it's a it's a really good case study in how do you engage people in these types of um, uh, uh, information based decisions that they they have to take because it was it 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 really the campaigns in lots of the countries applied lots of the learning from um, previous uh, uh, previous vaccination type. Um, studies there was a, there was a lot of work on the behavioral science of this and how to get people to accept it so modeling behaviors um uh, making sure that people know it's the norm really detailed work of getting into communities that have more skepticism um about uh, vaccination through using their own leaders not external people trying to come in and tell them what to do and and vaccination rates have been pretty high um in it. And, it, and it's um, so I think we've got to take the positives from that experience is that we've done, we've learned a lot about that. Uh, and but then still, uh, what we're left with is a rump of uh, vaccine, um, uh, vaccine skeptics through to conspiracy theorists um, who are not insignificant <laughs> in the population. Um, there are there are, you know, we, we have asked new questions around the pandemic specifically about whether 
uh, Bill Gates is actually using the vaccine to microchip us and, and all of those types of things. And you will get, you know, one in 20, uh, up to one in 15 people agreeing with those kind of crazy, crazy ideas. And um, then you get more people who have got um, concerns about uh, skepticism, skepticism about how quickly it was developed and still fears about uh, side effects that are um, uh, exaggerated in, in many ways. And so you've got kind of a total of about uh, 15, 15 ish percent of people who have got um, that kind of um, uh, rejectionism. So it's still not, it's still not insignificant as a problem but it could have been much worse looking at what we were coming from in terms of the bad um the the bad uh context that we'd built around vaccine safety and that so i think that is a real lesson going back to um giving so much oxygen to people like andrew wakefield who um is a uk uh researcher who was given a lot of space on uh, in media discussions of vaccine safety. And even though he was discredited, the research was discredited, it kind of stuck with people and informed uh, debates across the world, including in the US. Um, so we, we, we've, we need to learn those lessons about setting that sort of context and then build on the good lessons from um, the pandemic about how do you actually engage people on these types of things to encourage the behavior. And then I suppose my, the final point I'd say on this, though, is the trouble with all of that is it, while it's not big proportions of people who are rejectionists uh, or conspiracy theorists on uh, vaccines, what it has done is reinforced some of those communities because um, they've been pushed into enclaves on this and sharing their, their connections on these types of things and um there is a uh these types of events can increase that uh connection to those types of groups and that sense of radicalization among those groups because what tends to happen is get, people get pulled into one conspiracy theory and then it's a bit of a rabbit hole into others and and the conspiracy conspiracism can re lead to radicalization which can lead to uh, more extreme acts so there is the the pandemic has created an environment where for a minority rather than the majority it can push people into quite dangerous places and and that's that's a worry um uh, and all driven by how people see realities and how that ties up with their identity and then how it becomes self-reinforcing about being member of a group and just as the kind of cult theories have shown us I found it interesting as well that when I spoke to Elliot Aronson, he said that the more difficult it is to get into a group, the more you'll actually obey the rules of that group and the more you'll feel kind of grateful to be part of that group. Yeah. But then I also thought about how social media and the filter bubbles play such a large role in this because I, I have empathy in a way for many people who are in that world. So if you go to any of those kind of more conspiracy theory um versions of YouTube, if you want to call them that, that people consume content, it's often the same content over and over and over. Mm -hmm. And they or else if you do consume it on places like YouTube, again, the filter on the algorithm plays in so they're only seeing one view of the world. And it's always confirming, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. as well. And then when it's disconfirming, they listen for the little chink in the armor, and they go for that and ally with that as well. So I, I thought that was really interesting. And thanks for raising it. And or thanks for clarifying it. And I, it probably raises a question, and I'm sure lots of people have experienced this. We all know somebody, and it may be a family member, maybe you, who don't agree with the vaccine and don't agree with what has unfolded. But oftentimes the question of education comes up and, oh, well, it's an education thing or it's a country by country thing. And you are not wrong. There is a huge influence of education and country by country. It's a huge thing. Bobby has uncovered in his book. We probably won't have time to go deep into that. But I thought the education thing was interesting as well, because I raised it earlier on, and I don't want to let anyone down who's interested in that. And one of the ways you uncover this was through, for example, teenage pregnancy rates and the perception versus the reality, which is starkly different. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And I tested this on a few people and I found, again, some people, very highly educated people, got it really, really wrong. And then other people got it actually pr- much more accurate. And there was also, I found a difference between gender as well, which was interesting as well. So over to you here, because this is a, is a great case study of the overall mindset of mm-hmm. misperceptions and perceptions. Yeah, no, I mean, the teenage pregnancy one is fascinating. And I do use that a lot because it is that is such a case study of emotional innumeracy in in a sense. So the, yeah, I mean, uh, for, from your audience's point of view, it's good to think about the question, which is what percentage of women and girls aged 15 to 19 in your country do you think give birth each year? Um, and um, the answer in, let's just take, Britain, but it's, um, it's kind of it's uh, not out of line with others. Is one point four percent, but the average guess in Britain is nineteen percent. That one in five do. Um, but then in the US, it's two percent. The reality in the average guess is twenty four percent. Not a quarter of uh, teenage girls uh, give birth each year. And, you know, it's extraordinary. And obviously, when you think about that for just a second, you would think that's absurd that one in five people, so you've got an all-girl class of 30 and six of them are having babies every year, is um, is quite extraordinary when you when you, you think about it. No, not realistic when you, when you think about it. But it is that what we will be doing is remembering the stories where well, we're doing two big groups of things we'll be remembering the stories that we have seen because um they'll stick in our minds they're very they're negative usually framed quite negatively in the meets negative information sticks but it's also quite an emotional story so that kind of sticks with us it was that we are also really bad at updating our views over time um uh, because it was teenage pregnancies have halved in um the past 30 years um, across most countries. It's kind of a massive drop in teenage pregnancies, but we're not very good at updating um, our images. We get kind of stuck on, on old uh, old perceptions of uh, problems in particular. Um, so yes, and then we've got this, uh, so that, that's, that's like a great case study. Um, and it is it is related to, education levels and across the studies as a whole there is an education effect from this where um, you will tend to find um, people who've got higher levels of education tend to be better not on all things and there's some some lovely complications here that are shown in other experimental work where um, actually if you've got an issue that is really tightly tied to your identity like a political um, issue, say gun control in the US. Um, uh, it's actually the more numerate people who tend to get things more wrong um, because they can torture the data to fit their existing worldview better. Um, so if you're asking people what's true or false from different things and you're presenting them with information about it, they will do these mental gymnastics. The, the, the kind of um, more educated or more numerate people will do these mental gymnastics to try to work out, oh, how can I keep this in line with my uh, worldview? So it's not a perfect um, uh, relationship by any means to education, but there is there is an element of that. Um, what I did find you know, fascinating across the estimates was when we looked across all, all the different countries, on one of the studies, we asked lots of different questions, then we asked people how confident they were in their um, guesses. And there was this almost perfect relationship between the more confident the the people in the country were with their estimates, the more wrong they were with their estimates across lots of different types of questions. And this is the classic Dunning-Kruger effect where um, it's uh, where, uh, where you don't know about a subject uh, your very ignorance of that subject makes you overconfident because you think you know more than you actually know. So you've got, um, <clears throat> this is um, uh, really important in understanding these these types of studies is that confidence 
can be inversely related to um, correctness on on this. So uh, listening to confident people on uh, lots of these issues is no no guarantee that you're listening to the truth. Dunning Kruger is absolutely fascinating, and I think it's really interesting to tell the story of the bank robber mm. and the lemon juice. This is really fascinating because it really it's it's an exaggerated version of it, but. Mm. One of the things I have learned, and I'm sure you know from the amount of research you've done, is that I think it was Newton said, what we know is a drop. And the more you learn, the more you learn what you don't know. And mm -hmm. that's one of the things I find remarkable. Really well-read and well-researched people often are the most racked with doubt mm. because they know so much. And mm. somebody who is more ignorant or less educated on a subject is actually more likely to take action because of their lack of information and this was the, certainly the case with this bank robber yeah no it's a great great story um and it's i mean boil it down to uh the poor guy thought that um uh covering your your face in lemon juice meant that you wouldn't show up on um on security cameras and uh and obviously that doesn't work and he got caught uh it was incredibly uh confident about his um his plan <laughs> and um it's uh yeah no it is um it, it is a powerful effect and um it, exactly as you say it is um, important i like the, the lesson that, that i i take from it because it, it the, the danger is it sort of um you tip into patronizing um people who are less educated on on things and that's not it's not the point of it i think as, as as an analysis option it is the point about it is is to separate in your mind confidence from um uh correctness i guess and i, I think it's like it's another one of those little mental ticks is we we are we are quite drawn to confident people and people who are presenting their views as um uh as as the reality and or very definitely the thing that you need to do you know it's kind of we look for that leadership um type things and that you know again that's that sees as well in lots of different situations but i think there is there is that useful step back and system two type uh, approach of just checking <laughs> just checking and, and verifying that a little bit when we're when we are be when we are following someone um uh, or uh following their recommendations at least so yeah that, that's the thing that i take from it more is um uh, is to qualify how much weight we give to confidence i've already triggered the algorithm here brexit and trump so in that respect, because what happens is it reads the transcript, you see, the YouTube reads the transcript and the algorithm knows, and then it can actually go, you can't say, for example, boost a video to try and reach people. So Cambridge Analytica, for example. Right. And uh, this is important because we talked about, you, you mentioned there about the more confident somebody is, overconfident, Trump comes to mind, the mere exposure effect comes to mind because of Trump Towers, him being on the uh the diff the tv all these type of things had an effect but you cover it in depth in the book we won't have time to cover it in depth but because i mentioned it some people will be annoyed if we don't cover it <laughs> so i'd love you to just give a high level view of both so yeah now as you can imagine in a book on misperceptions and realities uh, or bending realities uh trump featured quite a lot actually because he was uh he was a uh, uh so many stories around how he treats um, realities. Maybe the, the one that sticks out most with me is just how he talked about uh, murder rates in US cities, where he just went around on the campaign trail saying uh, murder rate is the highest it's ever been, uh, it's been in the US for 40 years. Um, and it just wasn't true. Um, uh, so it, it was based on a, a small slither of truth about murder rates had gone up in some US cities year on year, but they were still much lower than 30 or 40 years ago. But he just kept saying it six or seven times um, on the trail. And it was such a good example of illusory truth bias of, you just keep saying these things, you know they're not true, or you 
kind of um, whether you know or not, you just keep plowing away with it because it's um, uh, you know it will have an effect and set a tone, and people will keep hearing it, and then some and more people will believe it as a result. So he was uh, that was a, a key a, a, a key aspect of his campaigning is just keep saying those types of things, um, which is you know happens in politics but he's an extreme example of how you just keep saying it um and then brexit's interesting because it was uh, for me it was it was much more about the tribal identity points um that you in the uk context you brexit identities became incredibly strong much stronger than your party political identity and um, people strongly identifying with whether they were a lever or a remainer so when you put to people whether the the pledge to spend uh, that that we send three hundred and fifty million pounds per week to the uh, European Union was true or false, um, massive disparity between leavers and remainers on whether they believed that or not. You know, um, hardly any remainers uh, believed it. Uh, a huge proportion of um, leavers uh, uh, believed it, and. And that's you know that's the same reality, but seen entirely differently depending on your political identity in this case. And so that's that's a, a real a, a real um, real life example of our directionally motivated reasoning or confirmation biases. We people who will be believing that will be uh, looking for information that reinforces it, and people who don't believe it will be looking for information that neglects it or rejects it. So, yeah, so they, they, they're kind of Trump and Brexit were riven with that interplay of um, views of reality and our identity and, and the leaders on, in, in, on all sides uh, were really playing with that and playing on um, those types of biases. And, and if only there was an algorithm where you could actually boost information and target the specific people that you wanted <laughs> to influence them even more. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. So, exactly. by the way, I, I just want to say the book is fascinating and must read. And Bobby has another book called Generations as well. He, he wrote uh, over the last couple of years that is just launched as well. And I'd love you to have you on in the future as well on that, Bobby. It's brilliant mm. work. So important for us to make sound decisions as much as we can make. Mm. That's for sure. But also for anybody interested, in immigration is in there. Uh, our sexual lives is in there. Everything is in the book. Everything's covered on these great studies uh, from Ipsos Moray and Bobby's work and with King's College, etc. But I thought we'd finish and we have 10 minutes. So 10 and 10, if, if the challenge is with you, Bobby, if you will, I, I'll um, share these 10 ways that we can manage our perceptions. And you set up this section by saying the starting point for most discussions of why we're so wrong is to view the answer as solely out there in the context. We're wrong only because we've been misled ra rather than it is being how we think the repeated errors that we make. So we can be conscious about this. We can make some changes. We can exercise the muscle. And in, in pointing out cognitive traps, you establish that we're not entirely slaves to them. And you share 10 ideas of how we can form more accurate views of the world. They have broad applications for how we see the world, what we prioritize, and how we approach new information. So the 10 are as follows. I'll read out one. Bobby, you'll riff on it and give mm -hmm. us uh, an overview. The first is, things are not as bad as we think, and most things are getting better. Yes, exactly. I mean, it's um, this relates to the emotional numeracy um, point that we uh, will uh, uh, change our view of reality because we've got this sense of um, that focus on negative information and sense of decline. So we just starting with that point that actually knowing that in particular, knowing that we are at the end of a long evolutionary chain of humans where treating negative information as urgent, and important is built into us. So this goes all the way back to cave people days of how um, uh, negative information tended to be threat-based information. Uh, so if you didn't take notice of it, say that lurking saber-toothed tiger that was about to pounce on you, then you're edited out of the gene pool. So we are kind of, uh, we're conditioned 
uh, on a long, long process to focus on the negative. And it's done as well as a species to be quite cautious and to, to focus on that type of thing. But it means that we tend to think things are worse than they are and that things are getting worse. So yeah, just having that in mind, that it's not as bad as you think, probably not as bad as you think, is a, is a, is a really useful starting point when you're looking at any of these realities. And the second, again, we touched on this throughout the show, was accept the emotion, but challenge the thought. Yeah, no, this is a really interesting one. And it's kind of it's almost therapy-like um, uh, that um, it, that actually comes from uh, a therapist, um, Andrew Marshall, who has written lots and lots of books on um, relationships and midlife crises in particular. Um, and... Uh, and it's it's a very similar point to the Kahneman one about system one and system two is you you've got to realize you're going to have an initial emotional reaction to this and you can't really, you can't stop that um it will happen and uh, uh and that's not that it's not actually healthy for you to try to stop that initial emotional reaction to these types of things but once that has gone you can challenge the thought that it leads to and think about is that is that the emotion driving this, or is that my uh, misperceptions driving this, or, it, or or is it real? So, and, and that's where you're trying to get system two to kick in and consider things a bit more carefully. And then three is cultivate skepticism, but not cynicism. Yeah, it's a really difficult one. This one. This is another treading the line one because what you you want people to be skeptical to t think about the information and not just believe it immediately, but you don't want people to be utterly cynical and just reject all information or to completely flip flop and believe the last thing they were told without um, any kind of uh, 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 belief in something. Because we, 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 you know, as humans, you want to have value system. We have beliefs, we have identities, all of those types of things. So it's a, it's a tricky one. Um, uh, and it's yeah, it's about us just checking with ourselves. Um, are we being uh, uh, too cynical about a particular an, a, an opposing point of view? Um, we are. What we tend to do is really question the motives of the other side, while assume good motives for people on our side of a debate. So yeah, that's where you tip into this cynicism um, that just rejects. Uh, other other sides so that that skepticism cynicism line is one really worth having in mind when you are when you're considering new information and another one then number four is other people are not as like us as we think yeah this is really this is really interesting there were the some of the biggest errors that you see in the book overall are thinking that our own circle is representative of everything else. There's a great one in from uh, where we asked about Facebook membership in different countries. And um, we asked in India, what percentage of Indian people, what percentage of Indians you think are on Facebook? And the reality at the time was about 20%, uh, maybe a bit under. But the average guess from the our sample was about 64%. And that was because these samples were done among online Indians, um, people living in India who had internet access because these, you know, you have to uh, be able to reach them. Uh, so that's not a fault of the methodology. That was kind of this very useful bit of the methodology because it, what it meant was those those Indian respondents that we had were all online, more likely to be Facebook um, users themselves, their friends, their family, all more likely to more middle class connected. Indian population, which was utterly unrepresentative of the rest of India in uh, in that technological um, uh, sense. And that's yeah, you know, some of that, that one of the biggest gaps that we saw throughout, and it shows you how powerful our comparison set is to us. That we think we are normal, um, uh, we are we think we are the norm, but we're not as normal as we think, um, and that that is uh, a really really important thing to bear in mind. I definitely know I'm not normal, Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. So, so number number five then is one that you alluded to earlier, particularly talking about media and content. Our focus on extreme examples also leads us astray. Yeah, absolutely. And this is so while we while we're not entirely normal and our experience is not utterly representative, the other the kind of 
conflicting tendency is to just be drawn to the most extreme example. And you think of a lot of our, say, for example, our image of immigration, um, certainly in a UK context, is, uh, uh, we know this from the surveys, is about asylum seekers. Um, when you talk about immigrants, people will be thinking about destitute asylum seekers, um, when actually that is not the norm for immigrants into a country because we're drawn to those more extreme examples. Partly we're drawn to it and the media cover it more, but the media cover it more because we're drawn to those types of emotional stories. So again, there's this system of pushing us towards a focus on the extreme and we just got to bear that in mind. And the other one, which we've covered before in the show, so you can keep this one short and I'm bearing in mind your time as well as unfiltering our world. So getting outside those filter bubbles. Yes, no, exactly. And there's a really, a really easy to say, very difficult to do, um, but it just takes focus from us. Um, and there are tools, increasing number of tools to help us try and mix up our feed. Uh, but do bear in mind that you know, a lot of this is unseen algorithms and we won't even know that our world is being filtered for us. So it's not, um, it's uh, something you need to be actively aware of. And then the next one is critical statistical and news literacy are going to be difficult to shift, but we can do more. Yeah, this is where we, we shift into not so much our personal behaviours as what can governments and others do to help this. And I think it is really important that we... Uh, we have changed our news and information environment and much quicker than we've changed our coaching and teaching of kids and ourselves of how to deal with that environment. And it's not like this is going to be the saviour and we just need to get into the school curriculum, something on critical literacy and news literacy, and that will sort this out because that's not, it's not much more complicated than that. But, but it is part of the mix. Um, our kids, you can't teach the human out of our kids. Um, so they will still have these biases and heuristics like like us and will fall into these types of traps. But you do feel like we haven't kept up uh, and there's more that we could do to, to support kids and then adults too. And as you say in the book, the difficulty is actually getting to change the curricula for schools mm. is a really big one. And, yeah. you know, inspired by your book, I was driving my son yesterday and I asked him, rather than going, how was your day at school? I said, what did you disagree with about uh, school today? And that was inspired by you. Uh, next one is facts still count and facts, fact checking is important. Yeah, so this is the point that um, people still do change their minds. There's, there's a, there can be a tendency in these sorts of books or analysis to, to make people think, oh, so it doesn't matter really, the facts, it's all driven by identity and emotions and all those. But that's not the case. Um, and it can also be the case that people think fact-checking and is useless, these kind of fact-checking organisations, because once the lie is out there, it's really difficult to um, get back. And that is true. It is really difficult. Um, but lots of fact-checking organisations try to build in um, inoculation, if you like, against the sort of pre-checking of things, trying to get it into the system. So it is still, again, an important part of the jigsaw here is uh, having people that are verifying things and that you can trust. Um, particularly going back to your point about having so much choice and so much information, what you actually find is the brand can become more important to people. If it's a trustworthy source, um, people are looking for those. People are looking for some sense of what's trustworthy out there. And um, those fact-checking organisations and, and media organisations that use them, like the BBC or some of the other um, big outlets, um, that's really important to give people some confidence. And then number nine is we, we, we're storytelling animals, so we also need to tell the story. Yes, that's right. I mean, I think the... One of the things that I get into a lot of discussions when you're presenting this at seminars and conferences is um, none of this focus on facts means that story isn't important. People often, we often think um, that we've got a choice between using facts or story. But actually, the best and most powerful way to do it is combining the two, trying to tell the story with the facts woven in. Um, so you need the real life individual level stories in order for people to connect but you can still connect that to more representative facts uh, if um 
if uh, if you weave it together well. You've done well keeping it to 10 minutes, Bobby. Yeah. <laughs> Better and deeper engagement is possible. Yes. No, I think this final point is, again, a sort of broader one. that I'm, I'm quite a fan of deliberative democracy, things like citizens' assemblies, um, which have been important in Ireland and, um, and the UK uh, and increasingly across Europe about deciding on difficult issues where you get people together and you present them with lots of evidence and um, from experts and the opportunity to discuss that themselves, between themselves. And it doesn't change people's worldviews or their identities, but it does get a more informed opinion from them where you can actually decide on things. And there has been you know, really important examples um, of where uh, things have changed around abortion or approaches to climate change on the basis of these types of deliberative events. I think we have become too disconnected from our politics in, in many ways and given more, one of the sort of maybe counterintuitive conclusions of the book is that our misperceptions and struggle with reality doesn't mean that you should take power away from people. It actually means you should give them more um, because then you're more incentivized to come to uh, more informed views uh, if there's actually something riding on it. Um, people can do that. So having more confidence in people, not less in the end. And Bobby, I have a final quote that I pulled from the book that I think just is beautiful and encapsulates everything we've talked about. But before I do that, where can people find you, find out more about your other books and your work, of course? I'm now um, director of the Policy Institute at King's College London, and um, that's that means all all my all my details are available there and very easy to get in touch. Awesome. And my final quote is as follows, and maybe I'd I'd love you to give a final word and message to our audience as well before we close. The one I have picked is as follows: We naturally look for confirming information and discount discount disconfirming information. When the evidence reaches a tipping point and there is sufficient weight against our current view, we do switch. The dissonance is emotionally unpleasant, and while we're attached to our current opinions, it becomes less unpleasant to shift than to cling on to them. The message is that we can't always solve misperceptions with more facts alone, but that we definitely shouldn't give up on them entirely. People are marvelously varied, and different approaches work with different people in different situations. I absolutely love that as an inspiring close from my perspective. What about you, Bobby? What's your final message to our audience? Yeah, I think it is that optimistic message, uh, which seems strange that something that uh, has shown that we can be very wrong and very tribal and very, um, uh, yeah, difficult on these types of subjects. But actually, in the end, it's um, a hopeful point about uh, uh, how people are open to change, um, how people can be engaged, and how, in some ways, I suppose my final final point is um, to bear in mind our own misperceptions of how bad it is out there on on these types of things, on um, people's perceptions of realities and how immovable uh, and tribal they are becoming. That is also an overblown sense of division, as the research shows. There's much much more decency and hope and goodwill out there than is uh, often comes across from how it's portrayed. Beautiful. The author of Perils of Perception, Why We're Wrong About Nearly Everything, Bobby Duffy, thank you for joining us. Been absolutely great. Thanks, Aidan. I hope you enjoyed that. A lot of information in that show, I know, but I could only get Bobby for one episode and I wanted to make sure we got the best out of that episode. We only covered a fraction of what's in this book. It's so dense with information. It's absolutely fantastic. And I want to thank our sponsor, Zai, boldly transforming the future of financial services with a suite of embedded products and services empowering businesses to create multiple payment workflows and move funds with ease. You can check out Zai at hellozai.com. I'll see you soon.